everybody. Welcome to Dinner from Death Row, the true crime cooking show. I'm your host, Colleen Pecco. Today I have an awesome episode prepared for you. You might have never heard of this guy before, but I can guarantee you probably know a little something about him. Today I'm going to cover Gary Heidnick. <sighs> Alright, so you might not know him by name, but I'm just going to take a guess and say you've seen a movie called... Silence of the Lambs. That's right, Gary Heidnick was one of Thomas Harris's main influences in creating the character of Buffalo Bill, along with Ted Bundy, Ed Gein, my boy Ed Kemper, and Jerry Brudos. But what Gary contributed to the Buffalo Bill persona was him keeping a pit in the basement full of women. But before we get into that story, we need to talk about what Gary's last meal on death row was. So Gary's last meal was... Two slices of cheese pizza and coffee. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't know if I'd want coffee before I'm getting murdered and killed, but uh, you know, if you want to have a bunch of stimulants and then get killed, you know, that's your prerogative. It's your last meal. And I'm so excited about this episode, not only because I think this story is horrifying, but super interesting, but also because I love making homemade pizza. So one of my favorite ways to have it, and today we're going to use a recipe from Joe Badia. He has Badia Pizzeria in Philadelphia, and that is actually where this story takes place, so I thought it would be really fitting, and it is one of the best dough recipes I've ever had. And we're also going to have some coffee by my friends at Backstage Roasters, so we're going to have a good one today. Now before we get into anything else, I also want to acknowledge my main source for today, which was Ken Anglade's book, Cellar of Horror. We're going to start prepping and getting into the terrifying tale of Gary Heidnick. All right, everybody, first thing we're going to do is get our dough prepared. We have all of our ingredients ready. We're going to measure them out and get this dough going. So we're going to have 355 grams of cool water. Highly recommend if you're doing anything with baking, get a kitchen scale. It'll save you so much stress about cups and all that crap. Don't need it. Just weigh everything out. So 355 grams of cool water. Do a half teaspoon of active dry yeast. We have two teaspoons of sugar, one tablespoon of salt, one tablespoon of olive oil, and 500 grams of bread flour. We're gonna get everything prepared, measured out, and the first thing we're gonna do is bloom the yeast and the sugar in our water. Get that going, it'll activate the yeast so that it will work in our dough. So now it's time to get into the terrifying story of Gary Heidnick. Gary was born on November 22nd, 1943, to parents Michael and Ellen Heidnick. He was born in the East Lake suburb of Cleveland, Ohio. Now Gary immediately had a really hard upbringing. His parents didn't like each other at all and they didn't like him really. So his parents didn't get along and they really didn't want to have a kid but they ended up having Gary and his younger brother Terry. They had Gary and Terry. Shit really is so annoying but you know, it's your prerogative. You're the one that had some spawn so name them whatever you want. Gary and Terry had these parents. They disagreed a lot. They ended up getting divorced when Gary was only two years old and he spent most of his childhood going back and forth between his parents' houses. His mom got remarried twice, his dad got remarried as well, and along the way he went through a lot of abuse. Kind of the common theme when we're talking about all of these murderers. So one of the most horrific things that happened to Gary is he had a problem with bedwetting. Also, red flag number one! Bedwetting problems as a kid a lot of times lead to them being murderers later in their life, so uh, look out for that one in your kiddos. But he would wet his bed and his dad would hang his wet sheets out the window so the whole neighborhood could see it. And he was humiliated and hated that his dad did this. And if he did it really bad, his dad would grab him by his ankle and hang him out the window next to his soaked sheets so that the whole neighborhood could see what he had done. Another horrifying thing that's coming up is uh, another traumatic head injury. Yes, look out for it. They'll probably kill someone. So. Keep an eye on your kids. Don't let them fall off the playground because they'll probably murder you in your sleep. But Gary was climbing a tree one day with his younger brother Terry. He fell out of it and he landed on the crown of his head and it uh, gave him a weird shaped head for the rest of his life. Um, didn't look great and the kids all called him football head. Hey, Arnold. Anyway, but yeah. This was really traumatic for Gary and it stuck with him for the rest of his life, kind of having a weird shaped head. Kids made fun of him and it really messed him up for the long term. Gary was kind of an interesting kid. His two main interests 
were business and the military. Like, all he would do is pick up newspapers and look out in investments and see what he could do in the future. And we'll see this later down the line when he starts investing money. He's actually a very astute investor and is really good at it. And that's another thing that we'll get into when it comes to the trial of them saying, was this premeditated when these women died? Because he really seemed to have it all together and knew what he was doing. So eventually Gary did join the military, something that he's always wanted to do. And he did become a hospital corpsman in West Germany, which is something we'll also see down the line where he's becoming going further into the medical field and it's something that he did enjoy. But while he was in the military, he kept having to get checkups like you're supposed to. He was diagnosed with schizoid personality disorder. And throughout his illustrious career, Gary was put into 21 psychiatric hospitals throughout his entire life. He also tried to kill himself 13 times. And that's just ones that were documented. He, and they all said that they weren't actual serious attempts at killing himself, but he tried ODing, he tried hanging himself, he ate the glass from a light bulb. One time he drove his motorcycle straight into oncoming traffic but somehow made it out of all of these things unscathed. So Gary went through a lot of bouts of silence when he was dealing with this mental illness, or when he would be in the psychiatric hospitals, he wouldn't talk to anybody, he would maybe write things down or do sign language, where he also had this weird way of showing that he wasn't gonna talk, where he would roll up one of his pant legs, and that was a signal that Gary was not talking that day. Gary had above average intelligence. Going, Gary would take mental aptitude tests, he always got way above average scores. Like, pretty much borderline genius. And this is gonna play part further when we're talking about, did he have the cognitive ability to murder these women? Did he think about it premeditated or was his mental illness so debilitating that he couldn't do anything? So in December of 1968, Gary got into an argument with his little brother Terry and decided uh, the best way to get back at him was, was to hit him in the head with a wooden plane. Now, it actually really messed up Terry's head. He had to go to the hospital and get it checked out. And while they're sitting there in the hospital, Terry's like, Hey, Gary, what if you had killed me? What would you have done then? And uh, Gary said to him, deadpan, staring at his brother in the hospital, I would have put your body in the bathtub and poured acid over it to dissolve the bones. I would have had to be careful when mixing the acid, though, because uh, I wouldn't want to damage the drain pipes. I would leave you there to soak for two or three days, and if there were any big bones left, well, I'd saw them up and uh, put them in a trash compactor. Then I would distribute them around the neighborhood in various trash cans. What a horrifying thing to be told after you're already being injured by your brother. He looked straight in his brother's eye and just said, oh, this is how I would have disposed of your body if I had killed you. So we're going to say big old red flag number three, that bad things are to come. All right, all of our ingredients are weighed out and ready to go. So next steps, we're going to take the yeast and the sugar and put them into the water. And we're going to let them bloom for a little bit so that they get nice and activated and make sure our dough is going to be perfect. So we're going to give them a little whisk. And we're going to let it sit here for about five minutes, let it get activated and ready to go. And then we'll continue on with our dough. All right, cool, we are ready to go. Our yeast and sugar has bloomed a little bit in the water. We're just gonna add our one tablespoon of oil. We're gonna leave the salt for later. You don't wanna mix it in now because it will kill the yeast and then you won't get a good rise on your dough. So we're gonna take our bread flour and our liquid mixture and get over to the mixer and uh, get this dough going. All right, so we are going to slowly put this liquid mixture in there so we can get the right consistency. You are also can totally do this by hand. Just a bit more work, but here we go. So you want to make sure you just do a little bit at a time so that you don't put too much in and it's too liquidy or not enough and it'll be too dry. All right, all our liquid is now in the mixer. I'm going to turn it up a little bit, still keep it on pretty low. We're going to let it go for five minutes and our dough will be cohesive. All right, so our dough is mixed for five minutes. We're gonna keep it in the bowl, take it off. We're gonna cover it in plastic wrap, let it rise for 30 minutes, and then we're gonna knead our salt into it and it'll be ready to go. All right, so now we have let our dough sit for 30 minutes and we are gonna incorporate the salt into it. So I'm just gonna put a little flour down. We're gonna get to mixing. All right, so Gary has had an interesting childhood. Obviously the whole plane incident with his brother, Terry. The next thing that goes for Gary is uh, 
He decides one day to get into his car and he drove out to the Pacific and um, wanted to find God. So Gary's sitting there, he goes out, he's in nature and God appeared to him, man. Like God said, hey Gary, you know what you should do? You should create a church of your own in Philadelphia. So Gary was super inspired and he was like, yeah, totally God, let's do it. So Gary went back to Philadelphia and he decided to create the United Church of the Ministers of God. I'm just gonna say if the name of your church is that long, probably bad things are gonna happen. Looking at you, Church of Jesus Christ of the Latter-day Saints. But Gary starts making this church and he actually, people take to it pretty well. Well, first he recruits his brother, <laughs> Terry. But then also, Gary's going around to the other mental institutions in the area, the ones that, you know, he's been popular at for a long time, and starts getting more members. So next steps for Gary is, uh, you know, trying to find some women. It was really important to him, because, you know, he wants to make a family. He wants to get a family that he's never had. Here comes in Anjanette Davidson. Anjanette Davidson was mentally disabled, and Gary had met her at one of the hospitals that he had been into. They start dating. Eventually, he impregnates her. They are going to have the kid. Gary one day was like, you know what? I'm going to bust your sister out of an institution that she's in. So they go, and they take her sister out of this institution. And Gary rapes the sister. <laughs> It's just gonna get worse from here. I'm just gonna say that. So he rapes her sister. The family finds out and they decide to press charges for kidnapping and rape. So Gary actually finally gets sentenced to three to seven years. So Gary spent four years going in and out of psychiatric hospitals and was institutionalized for that whole time. Gary eventually does get out of being institutionalized in 1983 and the first thing he wants to do is uh, find a virgin mail order Asian bride like we all do. Yikes. Gary finds a mail order bride. Her name is Betty Disto. She lives in the Philippines. They talked for two years and they're exchanging letters and Betty's falling in love with Gary because he was very charming when he was writing these letters. So eventually they decide, let's get married. And Betty's family was super against this. They didn't want her to leave the Philippines. They didn't want her to go to the United States. And they didn't know enough about Gary to think that this was a good idea. Betty comes over from the Philippines. Gary meets her at the airport. He picks her up and at this point, they're so happy to finally be together. And they're kind of in that honeymoon phase. Things went super well. They got married right away. But that honeymoon phase only lasted a week before Gary started abusing her and requesting sexual things from her that she was not too keen to do. And he kept telling her that he would kill her if she left him. And yeah, the threat is no joke and she was scared to leave. She ended up reaching out to the Filipino community in Philadelphia saying, hey, I'm concerned about this. I don't know what to do. So she got help from the Filipino community and they helped her formulate a plan. And she decided one day when Gary was out, put a passport and clothes outside so she would be ready to go. And when he was gone, she grabbed him and she left. She ended up reporting him to the police for spousal rape and abuse. And he was going to be convicted, but Betty did not show up to the trial. And ergo, he was let off scot-free. So Gary did not know that Betty was actually pregnant and she ended up having a son named JJ, just like my buddy behind the camera. Hi, JJ. <laughs> <laughs> but she ended up having his kid. So Betty actually never ended up divorcing Gary at any point, And she didn't end up going to any of the trials as well, which we will get into eventually. So at this point, our dough is nice and formed. The salt is completely in there. We're gonna put it back in here. We're gonna wrap it up in plastic. We're gonna let it sit in the refrigerator for 24 hours. Pizza doughs are awesome when you have a long, cold ferment. So this is going to be absolutely delicious. So next up, we're gonna get into the sauce and get going. Now we're gonna get our sauce ready. So a lot of pizza places do not actually cook their pizza sauce. I'm a fan mostly because I like onions and garlic and I wanna sweat them out a little bit and get it in there. So that's what I'm gonna do. So we're gonna have 28 ounces, one large can of San Marzano tomatoes. Highly recommend, this is like the gold standard for your whole peeled tomatoes. Really, if you want your pizza to be the best, this is what to get. Take a medium yellow onion, four cloves of garlic, a teaspoon of oregano, and some basil. And once we're gonna get that all in the pot and ready to go. Right now we're gonna start with the even more horrifying part of this story. Just gonna say, disclaimer, this one's not for the kids. It's going to get progressively worse and worse, and it is one of the worst stories I've ever read about, so, uh, so buckle need to up, let's make some pizza, right? <laughs> Today is November 26, 1986. It's actually the day before Thanksgiving. And 25-year-old Josefina Rivera is leaving her house. And she got into a fight with her boyfriend, who we will see in the future is a huge piece of shit, 
But they got into a fight and she decides to leave and she's a sex worker so she's like, yeah, I should go try to make some money. So Josefina Rivera leaves her house. She's wanting to get a good Thanksgiving meal the next day, wants to make some money. So she's walking down the streets and a Cadillac Coupe de Ville pulls up. And yes, I promise every episode will have a Colt 45 reference, so buckle up for that. <laughs> so a Cadillac Coupe de Ville pulls up and it is brand new. It is such a nice car. And Josefina's like, wow, this guy probably has some money. And who pulls up next to her but uh, Gary Heidnick, who actually always had a thing for cars, was really interested in them, and always had really, really nice ones. So Gary pulls up, and he asks her, you know, how much for you to come home with me? And they settle on $20. So she gets into the car. She noticed the initials GMH imprinted on the side of his car. So they leave. They stop at McDonald's on the way back, which is one of Gary's favorite places in the world. He goes there all the time. They all know him there. But he goes, they sit down, he gets a cup of coffee and doesn't offer her anything. Cheap piece of shit. But um, they go, they get the coffee, and then they go back to Gary's house. And when they're getting out of the car, they go up to the front door. Josephina notices he's a really weird key. It's like sawed off, this little piece of metal. And that's because Gary cut off the key and half of it is inside of the lock and the other half is with him. And she asks him why that would be. And he said, so... No other key would ever work to get into his house. Yeah, another red flag. Let's just talk about that. So they go inside. At first, Gary's like, hey, let's watch a movie. And Josephina's like, I don't have time for this. I have three kids at home, which she actually didn't, but good excuse to, you know, always be safe in a potentially scary situation. So they get down to business, go into his bedroom, and, you know, everything happened in the bedroom just fine. He had the $20 out for her. And then Josephina goes to leave, she starts to get dressed. And Gary had other plans in mind. He immediately just starts strangling her and he's choking her. And she just says, like, please, please, I have three kids at home. Let me go, I'll do whatever you want. Gary's like, all right, fine, then let me handcuff you. So she puts her hands behind her back, he handcuffs her, and he brings her down into the dreaded basement, the cellar of horror. So he pushes her down onto a mattress and he puts these muffler clamps around her ankles. And he had super glue, he super glues them and then pulls a hair dryer literally out of thin air and he starts blow drying the super glue so that it'll be dried super fast and she will be stuck there for a long time. Now Josephina is stuck in his basement and she's laying down on the mattress and Gary just curled up next to her, put his head in her lap and fell asleep. All right, so after a little while, Gary gets up and Josephine is looking around this basement. There's a huge ice box in there. She also notices there's a very shallow pit and is wondering what's gonna happen there. So Gary goes upstairs, he comes back with a pickaxe and he starts making the pit even bigger. Josephine realizes this is a horrifying situation and bad things are coming. So Gary decides to start telling Josephina about how society owes him a family. He feels like he was robbed of one multiple times over and he really feels like that's what he deserves. And he tells her of his plans to kidnap 10 women, like make a harem of women in his basement, impregnate all of them, and then he will have the family that he always deserved. Gary rapes Josephina and goes back upstairs. And at this point, she's really looking for a way out and she notices that there's boards over the window. But she's like, I'm gonna try and get out. And she actually does manage to. She climbs out the window and is still chained and is screaming at the top of her lungs and nobody came to help her. It was a really sketchy neighborhood and screams weren't unheard of there. So uh, she's screaming and screaming and Heidna hears her, goes out and drags her back through the window. Gary realizes I gotta do something so that I can make sure that she doesn't escape again. And he really gets to work on the pit further. He throws her in there, he puts a board over it and put sandbags onto it. And when I'm talking about a pit, I'm not talking about Buffalo Bill's pit where there's a freaking well in the, his basement. I'm talking about a couple feet deep, this woman being curled up in a ball, forced down on her neck, stuck there. So Gary leaves her there and then he turns up the music super loud so that nobody could ever hear her scream. At this point, Gary's on a roll and two days later, he picks up a second wife for the harem it was actually somebody he already knew, Sandra Lindsay. He actually used to date her, him and his friend Tony Brown, who we'll see again later, um, both used to have sex with her. They all went to the same mental facility. So he takes Sandra, he brings her to the house, and 
she joins the harem of women down there, which is now her and Josephina. But the thing about Sandra and Gary's past relationship is that he actually impregnated her before, and she had an abortion. So he felt like he was robbed from being a father, what he always wanted. So this was an obvious choice. He's already impregnated her once. He's sure he can do it again. He's raping these women. He's beating them. He's putting them in the pit and just all around torturing them. Sandra's sister actually came looking for her. She knew immediately, like, this is the guy that we need to look into. And she showed up at Gary's house. And of course, he denies it. He's like, oh, I don't know what you're talking about. I haven't seen her. She hasn't been here at all. And Gary, smart guy, decided, all right, maybe um, they won't come looking for her if they think that she just ran away. He had Sandra write a letter to her family and say, hey, I'm in New York, don't worry about me, I'll contact you later. He actually drove to New York and mailed it from there so that they wouldn't be worried. But they were worried, they kept looking for him. And they were making a fuss at the police station because they felt like nobody was doing anything. And they really weren't. They went from Gary's friend, Tony Brown, and they were like, hey, do you know this guy, Gary Heidnick? And Tony said, yes. And he said his last name is actually Heideke. He spelled it H-E-I-D-A-K-E. So when they plugged it into the system, they didn't find anything. And they, if they actually had the right spelling, they would have seen that he had previous kidnapping charges from six years ago. And the cops left it at that. They didn't look into it any further. They just decided, oh, okay, this guy's fine. It must not be him. But if they would have even looked at the utility records for the address that they had, they would have found this guy. They would have known immediately that, yes, he was keeping at least one woman in his basement. All right, now we are all prepped and ready to go so we can get working on this delicious sauce. Let's do it. All right, so next up, we are going to get our sauce ready to go. So pan is warm, and I'm going to put in a tablespoon of olive oil and a tablespoon of butter. Put a little olive oil in there. Next, we are going to sweat the onions and the garlic. Get them ready to go. We're going to throw in some oregano. couple shakes of red pepper flakes. <laughs> I'm a psycho. All right, so our onions are nice and glassy, and we're going to get in the tomatoes, which I threw into a food processor for a little bit. Going to be nice and good. I'm going to throw in a couple sprigs of basil for that delicious flavor. Also gonna put a pinch of sugar in if you disagree with putting sugar in tomato sauce that's cool but I'm going to because I like it so I recommend it it cuts the acidity down on the tomatoes all right so we're gonna let our sauce cook down for about 30 minutes to an hour the longer you do it the better it will be so we have to continue with our story because there's more kidnapping to be done next up is Lisa Thomas who's 19 years old and she was walking to her friend's house she left her pair of gloves there and then good old Gare pulls up. He's like, hey, where are you going? He actually thought she was a sex worker at first, so propositioned her. And she was not too keen on it. She was not pleased. And then she realized how nice of a car he had. And he looked like a nice guy. So he offered her a ride. So Lisa got into the car. She goes. She gets the gloves from her friend's place. Gary waits for her. And then they leave together. And Gary takes her to TJI Fridays. And that's how you know he really liked her. McDonald's was definitely where he liked to go more often, so TGI Fridays was definitely splurging. So they go to TGI Fridays, she has a wine cooler, and she took an allergy pill while she was there, and the combination of the two kind of messed her up. I mean, that's, a, that's how I like to party, so. They get back to Gary's house, and Lisa Thomas passes out. He raped her while she was asleep, and she wakes up, and he starts strangling her. She immediately is like, hey, I'll do whatever you want, please don't kill me. He handcuffs her, brings her down to the basement to meet the two other women that he's currently keeping, Josefina and Sandra. So now there are three women in the basement. A few days later, Gary picks up Deborah Dudley, and she will be the one that gives him the most flack through the rest of the story. She's the one that stands up to him all the time. Nobody ever found out where exactly he picked up Deborah Dudley from. So now there are four women in his basement. So a pecking order arises, and Josefina is at the top of this pecking order. Gary doesn't beat her as much, and he makes her actually beat the other women at this position of power. And sometimes he would leave them in the basement and put one of them in charge. And when he'd come back, he'd say, hey, who misbehaved while I was gone? And if they wouldn't say anybody, they would get beat. So really this entire time, he's pinning them against each other. He's getting them to actually torture each other so he won't have to as well. And this is getting to the point 
where he starts feeding them dog food, really treating them like they're not human at all, and only using them so that he can rape them and try to impregnate them so that he can make this family. And the food around the Heidnik household is only going to get a lot worse, but uh, that'll be coming up soon. So our sauce is looking nice and incorporated. We're gonna let it simmer for about 30 minutes to an hour. And uh, next we are going to get our dough rolled out. So let's do it. Okay, so we let our dough rise in the fridge for 24 hours. It's a totally new day and I'm not wearing the same clothes as yesterday and I've showered and everything. It's a whole new day. So this dough recipe makes two pizzas, which honestly, what's better than one pizza is two. They should always come in pairs in my opinion. So we're gonna take this out, form it into a ball, split it into two, form it into two balls, and then we're gonna let it rise a second time. Let's do it. So where we left off, Gary had just kidnapped Lisa and Deborah. And next up, he's going to kidnap another person, 18 year old Jacqueline Askins. And he kidnaps her and immediately brings her to the house throws her right into the pit. So now there are five women in his basement and they all are put into the pit. And one day Sandra was in the pit with the other women and she tried to push it off, like get the plywood off of the pit so she could escape. So Gary decided to punish her. Gary punishes Sandra by chaining her hands together and then hanging them above on a drain pipe. So her hands are above her head and he leaves her like that for days. So she's in severe physical distress and the other women are just having to watch this happen and see her. All right, she's so exhausted. Her hands have been above her heart for such a long time. So Gary's telling her to get it together. He's like, don't collapse. You have to keep saying this. This is your punishment. She does end up collapsing. I mean, who wouldn't? And when she collapses, Gary ends up picking her up, putting her back up and making her stand. And she's not eating at this point, probably just thinking I'd rather just die. So Gary decided to take bread and just shove it down her throat so that she would stay alive so, you know, he can continue his awesome impregnation scheme. So he shoves the bread down her throat and then tapes her mouth closed. And then he threw her into the pit and leaves the other women in the basement as well. So when Gary comes back, Sandra is dead. She had choked on the bread and asphyxiated and is now left dead in the pit. So Gary now has to figure out what he's going to do with the first dead body. And he picks her up and he carries her upstairs. And the next thing that's heard is the sound of a power saw. That is right, Gary, as we learned from his, you know, debacle with Terry, knows how to dispose of a body pretty damn well. So he starts sawing her up into pieces and he puts some of her into a food processor and he mixes it with dog food and feeds it to the other women. That is right, we have reached everybody's favorite part of this episode, which is Cannibalism Corner. It's just gonna keep getting worse, folks, so uh, stick in with me. Let's eat some pizza, too. The next thing that he has to worry about are the big pieces of her body and how to dispose of them. And Gary's awesome idea was to cook them. So he puts them into all the big pots, like big stock pots, and he starts cooking it down. And the neighbors start complaining about a horrifying smell permeating through the neighborhood. And the cops come, and Gary answers the door, and he's like, oh yeah, I just burned my dinner. And the cops left. They're like, oh, he burned his dinner. I saw this burnt pot of food on the stove. It's totally fine. I don't know what you're cooking, when it smells like rotting human flesh throughout the neighborhood, and you can get away with saying you just burnt your dinner. You know, good old Gary's making his specialty of durian and human feces again. It wouldn't smell that bad. Ugh. All right, so both of our dough balls are ready. We're gonna let them rise a second time. I'm just gonna leave it on the counter, cover it up with a damp towel, and let them rise just till they double in size. So should be a couple hours, and then we'll keep going. All right, our sauce is looking amazing and delicious. So next, we're going to get the oven preheated to 500 degrees going to put the pizza stone in there so it gets really nice and roaring hot so when we put the pizza on there it'll crisp up nice on the bottom all right so i've let both of our doughs rise we're going to work with one at a time and let's keep moving all right, so our oven is set to 500. It is nice and preheated. Stone is in there, got nice and hot. So next steps, we're gonna get our dough ready for putting the pizza all together. 
So we're gonna get our hands, nice covered flour. Make sure you get the knuckles. And we're gonna just stretch it out over it. We want our pizza to be about 14 to 16 inches. You know, if you're feeling fancy, you can do the trying to throw it up in the air, but that's really how you break your pizza dough and it'll go in the middle, so don't do that. Unless you really want to, and then, you know, it's on you. So I'm gonna start kind of getting like this, and then we're gonna roll it out like this slowly. So, last we left off. Gary Heidnick is becoming more and more unhinged. And he's getting worried that the women are going to escape, that they're going to start making a plan and figuring out how to get out of there. So, the next horrible thing he decides to do, if they can't hear me coming, they'll never be able to figure out a good escape plan. So, he then decides to take screwdrivers and shove them into their ears so that they would be deaf. And he would do this until blood and pus would come out of their ears. Which is absolutely horrifying. Also, pus is my least favorite word in the English language. So, uh, yeah, I really hate this part of the story. So, Deborah is the one that is fighting back the most to Heidnik. She's the one that's standing up to him at every turn. And Heidnik started getting really sick of this. So, he figured out the best way to shut her up was to bring her upstairs and to show her Sandra's head in a stock pot on the kitchen. And her ribs were on a roasting rack in the oven as well. Deborah came back downstairs and she was not quite the same after that. The other women were wondering what he could have possibly done to shut her up. And uh, yeah, seeing something like that can definitely do it. So the next thing that Gary started to do to these women was get into electroshock torture. So he had all of them, except for Josefina, get into the pit, filled it full of water, and had a live wire that went to them and touched the chains that they were all bound together with. So the first time he did this, he had Josefina hold the wire itself so that he wouldn't be culpable. He actually had her sign a confession stating that she was the one responsible for the electric shock torture. And the first time they did it, he sets it off, and Deborah is the one that took the brunt of the shock, and it immediately killed her. He then takes Deborah's body, he throws it into the freezer, and they're figuring out what the next steps are going to be. And at this point, because Josephina had signed that confession, Gary starts kind of treating her like a girlfriend. He's like, well, if she's already culpable, then there's nothing else that I can do. If I ever get caught, I'm going to throw her under the bus and she'll be the one to blame. So he starts taking her out to, you know, his favorite restaurant, McDonald's, and he also brings her to dump Deborah's body into the woods. So at this point, Josephina is completely in Gary's trust. He's treating her like a girlfriend and giving her much more leeway when it comes to getting out of the house. All right, our dough is ready to go. 14 to 16 inches. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> All right, yeah, it's about 14 to 16 inches, I'd say. So we're gonna take this, we're gonna get it on to the stone, and we're gonna assemble our pizza, and then we're gonna get it in the oven, we'll be ready to go. So it is time to finally assemble our pizza. So I'm gonna throw a little semolina down on the pans, on the stone, so that it doesn't get stuck. Yeah. All right, so we're going to get our dough on here. We'll shrink a little bit. It was a little over ambitious with my 14 to 16 inches, so we'll get her right on there. It's already shrinking up a bit. All right, so I'm going to get the sauce that we made on, some fresh mozzarella, some shredded mozzarella, and then we'll uh, get her going. So at this point, Josefina is completely in Gary's trust, and she finally convinces him to let her go see her family. So they had a plan because Gary figured, all right, fine, I'll go let her see her family, and then if she does that for me, she has to bring another woman or another woman back. So Josefina is realizing this is probably her only opportunity to get out and help the other women that are in the basement. So she goes, and Gary drops her off. And she says, all right, fine, I'm going to go see my family. And then you come pick me up at this location, and I'll have another woman ready for you. So he drops her off, and he leaves. And Josefina immediately goes to her boyfriend's house. Well, her ex-boyfriend, I don't know, it's been a couple months. But she goes, and she tells him, like, hey, I've been trapped in a pit in a basement for months with these other women. And you know what? He didn't believe her. That's why I said before, he's a huge piece of shit. Yeah, he's a huge piece of shit. Because he thought she was making it up. And I'm like, well, maybe wonder where all these bruises come from, from ligature marks. And uh, 
I don't know. She's just been gone and is emaciated by the time she comes back. So eventually, he listens to her, and they decide that they should go to the police. And the police immediately don't believe her either. But after seeing the marks on her wrists and ankles, they decided, all right, something's up. So they go with her to the location that she was supposed to meet Gary at. And they pick him up, and they bring him into custody. So at this point, he's starting to ask them, oh, did I miss a child support payment to Betty? Why could you possibly be arresting me? And that's what he feigned the entire time. That's what he was doing. Or that's why he was being arrested. But eventually, they get a search warrant for his house. They have to get a crowbar to get the door open because of Gary's special key. So they get in there, and they find Lisa and Jacqueline chained together on the mattress, sleeping. And they find Agnes in the pit. They're all beaten and starving to death. And at this point... Gary is finally in custody and will never get out again. The media starts finding out about this and they go absolutely wild. I mean, the story has everything. It has murder. It has rape. It has dismemberment. It has cannibalism. I mean, what else could you look for in any horrifying story? So the thing that's going to come with this case is that there's no doubt ever that he did these things. He's undeniably guilty, but what's going to come into play the most is whether or not he was legally insane and shouldn't be held accountable for these crimes and should be put in a psychiatric hospital for the rest of his life or sentenced to death. All right, y'all. Our pizza is ready to go. I'm going to put it in the oven for about 8 to 10 minutes, but keep an eye on it because, you know, might as well. But uh, we're going to get this in there. We're going to make some coffee and we're going to wrap this up. to do is get our coffee ready so then we can have our last meal. We're going to do a standard French press. I have some awesome fresh coffee beans from our friends at Backstage Coffee Roasters. I already ground them up. We're going to get them in the front press. We're going to let it bloom and then uh, we'll be set. So Gary's finally in custody. This monster has been put away after like way too long. But now comes the trial and really everybody's concern is what's going to happen. Because in Pennsylvania, you can only be sentenced to death row if you commit a first degree murder. So they have to prove that there was premeditation. This is a very controversial subject because how could he not have had premeditation? But at the same time, did he actually mean to kill these women? I mean, if he wanted a harem of women in his basement to impregnate and make a huge family, why would he kill them? So the DA was really pushing for a death sentence and there was a judge that kind of backed him and it really skewed the trial. The more you read about it, the more you realize this was so messed up. And really, I don't think he deserved the death penalty. There's no reason he would have killed them on purpose. Personal opinion, but I don't think that they should have been put to death. But thanks for dying, Gary, because I gotta make this show about you. There was a huge disagreement on the verdict. Nobody knew it was gonna happen. But after 11 months, he was finally charged with two accounts of first degree murder and sentenced to death by lethal injection. On July 6, 1999, Gary Heidnick was finally put to death. He was the last person sentenced to the death penalty in the state of Pennsylvania. And he had no last words. But he did have a last meal. We're just going to let this coffee bloom. We'll top it off. And then we're going to have our cheese pizza and coffee. And there you have it, Gary Heidnick's last meal on death row, cheese pizza and coffee. I'm not going to lie, this pizza looks amazing. I'm so excited to rip into it. I hope it really turned out great for you as well. I just want to say thank you so much for watching episode two of Dinner from Death Row about Gary Heidnick. I'm so excited to continue the rest of this season. I have some awesome, awesome, terrible people to cover this season. So stick with me. I think you guys are going to like what you see. 
But please, if you like what I'm doing, subscribe, like, let me know who else you want me to cover. And I just want to say thank you to my friends again at Backstage Coffee Roasters. The link to their coffee is in the description. Check it out. It's so good. The last thing to do is going to be to eat some pizza. And I uh, just want to say, in the last words of John Wayne Gacy, kiss my ass. <laughs>